All right, good to see everybody here this evening. Take a songbook. Let's start by singing together. It's number 195 in your book. 195, glory to his name. Down at the cross where my Savior died, let's all stand together to sing. And Brother Bob will lead us. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy for soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. All right, good singing. Remain standing. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to hear from the uh, Children's Bible Club here on Wednesday nights, and uh, they're going to sing for us to start the service off. So let's pray together, and then we'll hear from them, all right? Father, we bow before you tonight. We thank you for another opportunity for us to be together. Thank you for Wednesday night church, and Lord, we look forward to this service each and every week, and we thank you so much for the things that uh, we have learned and decisions that we have made because of Wednesday evening Bible study. And Lord, we pray your blessing on our service now this evening. Uh, please uh, bless the boys and girls as they sing, help them to sing with, from their heart and sing unto you. And Lord, may we receive a blessing and may you be pleased with all that goes on in our service this evening. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you may be seated. Make a way to escape. 
all learned that song amen well that's good do what's right amen all right great 57 57 in your book let's sing in together at calvary years i spend in vanity and pride Brother Bob. on that first together years i spent in vanity and pride caring not my lord was crucified no it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. On that third, now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh. The love, the true salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gold that God did spend at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Tonight's letter is from the Rice family, missionaries to Italy. Dear praying friends, praise the Lord for the warmer weather. We drove south in mid-December. We have been reminded in the past few days why we came down south as we have hit freezing weather. We are very thankful that most of the days and nights are above freezing. On our way down south, we hit a piece of a semi-tire that had popped in front of us. 
We didn't know it, but it actually damaged one of our back tires and messed up our bumper, making us lose our license plate in the process. After arriving a day later, someone pointed out a problem with our tire. It looked like a softball knot on the inside of the tire that was actually rubbing on the leaf spring. Praise the Lord, it didn't blow out. Souls Harbor Baptist Church in Roanoke, Alabama has graciously allowed us to park at their church and call it home for the next few months. But they also got two new tires for our van. What a blessing they have been to us. We didn't have a whole lot on our calendar when we came down south, but have tried to follow the Lord's leading. We visited a camp meeting in Florida during the 1st of January. We went to enjoy the preaching and just enjoy some fellowship with friends. Shane ended up preaching several times and we scheduled a few meetings and picked up a new supporting church. We have been stopping in churches wherever we are and God has been providing meetings. It is both exciting and scary to live by faith. It is awesome watching God provide. We are thankful for God's provision and care for us. He continues to meet needs in many ways, both big and small. Our vehicle has had electrical problems for many months now. Our instrument cluster keeps malfunctioning. We have had it in the shop a few different times in a few different states. It is very difficult to leave it for any amount of time as it is our only real source of transportation. We were in northern Alabama with the Lighthouse Baptist Ministries. They have a ministry that helps independent Baptist missionaries. Brother Palmer has been a blessing helping us to get our van fixed and saved us over $1,000. The tire we hit back in December also knocked out our front end alignment. That has now been fixed as well. We are very very thankful for the work that we were able to get done. As an update to the financial needs that have been mentioned, we are currently at 60% of our funds for outfit and passage, We still need about $4,000 to finish out this fund. For the vehicle fund in Peru, we received 11% and still need $1,800. The first step for our visas has been completed. We are part of the Baptist Association in Italy. We can now work on our applying for our visas at the Italian consulate. Please keep these things in your prayers. Again, we appreciate your generous support and prayers for us. Serving the King, Shane and Kathy Rice. Good report from the Rices, and uh, appreciate that. Now, get your prayer guide out. Anybody need one tonight? Anybody uh, did not get one when you came in? Everybody all set? Uh, look at the back uh, first where the uh, coming events are. And, uh, of course, be praying for the RU Inside tomorrow night down at the Central Reception Center. And uh, continue to pray for God to bless there. And uh, Reformers Unanimous here Friday night at 7 uh, to 9 p.m. Then Saturday morning out at London from 8.30 to 10.30. And, of course, our regular soul winning and bus visitation at 10 a.m. here at the church and then Sunday will be I love my family Sunday and it'll be a great uh, Sunday together and uh, there will be family portraits taken after service and uh, you can um, is there they sign up for that or do they have time slots or anything no just uh, first come first serve okay and uh, but you'll have a couple places set up over in the fellowship hall so you can uh, get your picture taken and it uh, turns out real nice and then remember March 6th will be our higher ground offering for the uh, doors uh, for fellowship hall for uh, to upgrade the lights and uh, also to go towards some new carpeting here in the auditorium that'll be our goal for this year and uh, we'll start on our path to that on March the 6th okay and uh, appreciate you praying and doing what the Lord would lead you to do on that. Okay, uh, on the uh, inside of your list there, uh, of course, praise report for the work at the prisons last week and the men that were saved and uh, the work that's being done through the RU program there. And uh, we praise the Lord that Brother Van Gelder's knee replacement went well on Monday and Brother Paxton's surgery went well and Dave's here tonight. And uh, good to see him and, and uh, continue to pray for the recovery. Now, Brother Van Gelder... Had the one knee done Monday, he gets his other knee done tomorrow. And uh, so that's then uh, probably Friday or Saturday he'll head over to rehab uh, over in Hilliard. And so uh, keep uh, keep him in prayer. You know, if you've ever uh, had someone or known someone been through that knee replacement, the rehab is the uh, tough part. And so uh, keep him in your prayers. But I spoke to them this evening, and they're doing well, and uh, he's ready to go for the next one. Okay, and so we appreciate you praying for these fellas.
All right. The other needs is are listed there. Um, <clears throat> underneath cancer, uh, if you would add the name of Tom Busick, that's B-U-S-I-C. This is a cousin of Diane Stiltner. Tom's been on there before, but he's, he's back. His cancer has returned, and so we want to put him back on there and please lift him up in prayer. I know Diane would appreciate that. Okay, can you pray for these other needs as they're listed and the unreached people groups and then, of course, our missionaries uh, highlighted tonight uh, by the Rices who are uh, raising the money and the, dep the deputation to head now to Italy uh, for the work God's called them to there. Okay, I'm going to have Brother Wallace come tonight. Good to have Brother Wallace back in church. This time last week, he was in the hospital, and uh, he's back with us now and doing well. And I'm going to have him lead us in our prayer tonight. Let's unite our hearts together uh, in prayer as he leads us audibly. Pray along with him silently. That's how you keep for your mind from wandering away uh, during prayer time. And uh, just pray along with him as we take these requests to the Lord in prayer. Brother Bob. Let us pray. Father, we just certainly thank you again, Lord, for all the great things that you do for us. Lord, I do thank you for bringing me through the hospital stay, and I do thank you for bringing Brother Paxton, Brother Paxton and, and uh, uh, answering prayer and bringing them through the surgeries, and, and Lord, what a great God you are. And Lord, as we walk by faith, and help that faith to grow as we pray and we hear these prayers answered. May we be careful to give you all the credit, and, and Lord, that you, you have worked through those doctors, you work through people who are not even your children, to, uh, Lord, to uh, uphold your name, that we can exalt your name. And, Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray for the coming events uh, at our church. I, I pray for, uh, uh, Lord, these things that are coming up for the, uh, as we project uh, uh, doing some new things around here for this year and, and collect the money for it. I pray that people will give sacrificially. And, Father, it's uh, to keep your house in order and, and to... Uh, Lord, take care of your house. Uh, we should, should uh, um, always remember that uh, you are worthy, Lord, to be presented in such a way to people that would uh, not in any way degrade the great God you are. Father, I do thank you for the missionaries that we support here and, Lord, uh, uh, the uh, uh, great works that are going on that, Lord, uh, sometime after we're in heaven, you will reveal how you worked all this to together. And Lord, uh, may uh, uh, that continue as you continue to work here and, and elsewhere. May your gospel be spread all over the world, Lord. And may many, many, many get saved because no one knows when you'll step out on that cloud and you'll come and get your bride. So Father, help us to be always mindful of that. When anyone comes up to us, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, may we always think, I wonder if that person is lost or saved. May we start a conversation with them, and Lord, or give them a track, whichever the case may be, but they'll get the gospel somehow. And Father, help me to be uh, uh, more, um, uh, I would say, more uh, uh, reliable in doing that all the time. Lord, uh, we all fail, we all uh, fall short sometimes because we're in a rush. But Lord, help us to be mindful of souls. Father, thank you again for uh, the things that we do around here. I thank you for the prison ministry. Lord, you've blessed in such a way that, Lord, now we're at uh, one other prison and in, in institution and we're going to another one here shortly. Lord, I pray that people will be praying here in this church about becoming a part of that ministry and, and Lord encouraging those people that they can be different, that God can help them to be an overcomer without relapse and they can encourage and help others. We've already seen that from people moving from the CRC to London and Lord we get letters in the mail about how their testimony has influenced other people to write our church and want to get involved in that ministry. So Lord I pray that that will continue and, Lord, that will continue to grow. And, and Lord, that uh, people will be uh, uh, mindful that there are a need for workers. And, Lord, uh, I, I pray that their people would pray about it. And if that's where God wants them, that not hesitate to stand up 
and raise her hand and say, I'll go. Father, as uh, we continue in our, our service tonight and our pastor comes and opens up your word, and Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit that lives within each and every one of his children here tonight will be attentive to what is being taught. Lord, I want to get something out of it. I want to walk out of this place knowing that I at least learned something, and Lord, uh, that would help me to grow and help me a bigger, to be a better light for you tomorrow. And Lord, that's something I could use even tomorrow to witness to somebody and bring them to the foot of the cross where they could make an eternal decision of where they're going to be in, 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 after death. So, Father, help us now. Uh, be, uh, may your grace and your mercy abound as we uh, look into your word tonight. May our pastor hide himself behind the cross. May he not say anything that you would not want him to say. Lord, I know his desire is to stand here and open up your book and preach the truth. And Lord, without wavering to the left or the right. So give him strength, Father, as he comes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to take a moment and recognize our guests that are with us. We're always, of course, pleased when folks visit, especially on Wednesday night. And uh, it's good to see Tyler back with us. And Tyler brought a guest with him tonight. This is Maggie, if I remember right. And uh, good to have you with us. Where, where's Maggie from? You go to Ohio State. Good. All right. Good to have you this evening. Thank you so much. That's great. And then a couple right back here on the back row are the Van Sickles. And uh, they're from our area here. And they're radio listeners. And uh, they came to be in the service tonight. Good to have you folks with us tonight. Thank you. You're a blessing to come and visit with us. And uh, Sue Burns, good to see you over here. And uh, glad you're here tonight. That's wonderful. All right. The usher is going to hand you a visitor's card and a uh, little bit. We'll have an offering, and then you can just put that card in the plate when it goes by. And I uh, want you to keep the pen as our gift to you for coming. And uh, you have come during I Love My Church Month. And uh, the signs around the building and such that you see. And uh, we have a song we sing. And then we're going to have a testimony tonight on from the parishes on why they love their church. And uh, Neil and Brenda, it's been five years, six years? Six, six years. Wow, that's amazing. And... Uh, and I hate to see what happens when you run out of fingers, but I don't want to know, all right? But uh, just uh, what, a, what a tremendous blessing the parishes have been to us and faithful uh, servants of the Lord here at Bible Baptist Church, and we, uh, we love the parishes, and uh, we're so, so grateful. Again, another one of those couples that are faithful and do, do much of what they do behind the scenes and don't uh, need the spotlight, don't necessarily need recognition, don't want recognition, they just want to quietly serve the Lord, and uh, we, we appreciate them so much, and we love them, and we're going to hear why they love their church, all right? Let's sing our song together, then we'll hear from Neil and Brenda. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength the joy of the Lord is my strength oh the joy of the Lord is my strength I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church oh the joy of the Lord is my strength amen We're the parishes. This is Brenda and I'm Neil. We've uh, been coming to Bible Baptist Church for over six years to the month. Uh, Brenda has nominated me to speak on behalf of the family. Uh, Brenda found Bible Baptist Church for us through her brother, which lives in another city. Uh, Brenda was raised Catholic and attended Catholic schools growing up. She surrendered herself to the Lord was baptized shortly after we started coming to Bible Baptist Church. I was brought up in a Christian home on the west side of Columbus uh, and was baptized when I was about eight years old. Our testimony is why we love the pastor. Focusing on one area, his devotion. His devotion to the Lord, the church, his family, his church family, Daily radio broadcast, which is so appropriately titled, Words to Encourage. 
his devotion to sharing the Lord's Word and the meaning of the Bible with us to make sure we understand God's Word and how to apply it in everyday life. His devotion to soul winning. His devotion to anyone that needs a helping hand, direction on where their life should go, where the, who needs lifted up, a shoulder to lean on, or an ear to listen. His devotion to the community. I don't have the facts, but I wonder how many other churches have country fair days or turkey dinners. The example he sets by not sitting at the church waiting for people to come, but going out uh, trying to find people and bring them to the church. His devotion to Reformers Unanimous. Not just one program for our church, but outreach programs to the prison. I wonder about his... I'll use the term enthusiasm about Oreos. Did that help lead him to Reformers Unanimous, his, his uh, dedication there? But it, what truly matters is that he's bringing uh, people to the Lord and he's helping people with addictions. His devotion to our music and our hymnals. In the six years we've been coming here, I've only once seen him use a hymnal, and that was during a missions conference. How can anyone, anyone memorize all those hymns? And when Bob alternates the verses like he does, the pastor's right there singing along. That just is amazing to me. His devotion to having a winning attitude. I've never known a leader of a church, an organization, or a company to have such a positive attitude all the time. As you know, any leader, whether it be formal or informal, sets the tone. Um... When they're in a bad mood, people stay out of their way, avoid contact with them, and keep their heads down. You never have to worry about that with a pastor. You know when to see when you see him, he always has a smile and a word of encouragement for you. He's one of those people that you just like to be around and appreciate so much for brightening your day. There are many other reasons why our pastor is so valued. We could easily spend four hours or the equivalent of half of one of his sermons. We love you, Pastor and Kathy, and thank the Lord for bringing us together. Very good. 523, would you turn with me? 523. I sought a flag to follow a cause for which to stand. Let's stand together as we sing. 523. <clears throat> On that first together. I sought a flag to follow, a cause for which to stand. I sought a valiant leader who could my love command. I sought a stirring challenge, some noble work to try, to give my life fulfillment, my dreams to I found them all in Jesus, the life, the truth, the way. Beneath his flag I'll take my stand and follow him today. I sought a ringing answer for all my doubts inside, a torch of truth uplifted. My searching step to guide. I sought a word of wisdom, a true authority. I sought to know life's purpose, to solve its mystery. I found them all in Jesus, the life, the truth, the way. Beneath this flag I'll take my sin and follow him today. Amen. Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
Let's sing that chorus together. I found them all in Jesus, the life, the truth, the way. Beneath his flag I'll take my stand and follow him today. I sought for satisfaction on that last together. I sought for satisfaction for yearning deep within. I sought for full deliverance from chains of guilt and sin. I sought for peace and pardon, for freedom from my fears. I sought a hope to cling to beyond these passing years. I found them all in Jesus, the life, the truth, the way. Beneath his flag I'll take my stand and follow him today. Amen. Good singing. You can be seated. Ushers will come and they'll receive our offering now here for tonight. Give as God has blessed and prospered you. In fact, we're going we're gonna to begin to take some of the Wednesday night offerings for the country fair. We're uh, 87 days or 86 days away uh, from the country fair. It'll be here before we know it. Spring is coming. Yes. I know we're getting a little snow here next day or so, but uh, spring is coming. So, uh, And that'll be here before we know it. So um, we're going to prepare for that and be praying for that and uh, look excited about uh, what the Lord's going to do with the country fair this year. So uh, let's pray. We'll ask God's blessing on our giving the offering tonight. Brother Paul Abel, I'll have you pray for us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us where we can come here and hear the word of God preached tonight. And we just pray that you'd be with the pastor and uh, we thank you for the word of God that you've preserved and kept in our language over these many years and we just pray that you'd continue to uh, lead him in uh, preaching the word here and we ask that you'd uh, bless this offering and bless it uh, to the world whatever we use it for and we pray in Jesus name amen, amen. All right, take your Bible this evening, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 3, would you please? 2 Peter chapter 3. Continuing our studies here on Wednesday night, going through 2 Peter. We're into the last chapter now, and we're going to be dealing with someone that here Peter uses the word scoffers, all right? Beginning in verse number 1. 2 Peter chapter 3, this second epistle, beloved, now write, 
write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And we're going to stop right there, right? and we'll, we'll maybe pick a couple of those verses up yet, but we're going to stop for our reading right there tonight. Father, I pray that you would speak to us now as we open up your word and we glean the truths from this passage that you would have for us to learn this evening. Father, I pray that you would speak to every heart tonight and you would open our understanding as we look into the only book you've ever written. And I pray, God, that your will would be accomplished in each and every heart in life. So, Holy Spirit, be our guide and be our teacher this evening. And I'll thank you in advance what I believe you'll do in each one of our hearts. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Scoffers. Jude, in his book, the Lord had him call these same folks mockers. They'll be mockers in the last days. Um, and, and by the way, they're not just in the last days. We've always had scoffers. Uh, you've always had mockers. You've always had scornful people. Uh, back in Psalm 1, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Scornful are the scoffers. Uh, the word means... Those who deride or reproach or ridicule, all right? Uh, usually with a contempt towards whatever object they're ridiculing or deriding. And so they hear, they, they, they're deriding, they have some contempt, they hate, they, they reproach any thought about the coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, most people, if you realize when they talk about the uh, end times, they never say, are we close to Jesus coming? They say, are we close to the end of the world? Is the world going to end? That's what they're concerned about. Uh, not many people say, are we close to Jesus coming back? Uh, and they, they don't approach that subject very, very often. Uh, they they want to ridicule or, or make, uh, make fun of or bring reproach unto anything that has to do with God or religion. And the reason is, the Bible says, they're, notice it says they're scoffers, they're walking after their own lusts. That's why. That's really getting down to the source of their unbelief. The source of why they don't want to believe in God. The source of why they don't want to believe the Bible. The source of why they don't want to understand the Gospel. Listen, the Gospel of Jesus Christ is pure and it's holy and it requires that we live pure and holy lives. And there, that's a restraint, my friend. And, and when you don't want the restraints, then you want to just do whatever you want to do, then you have to, you have to discredit the gospel. And you have to say it's not true. And it's not worth anything. And the bottom line is, they, it, their opposition begins and ends with their own lusts, their own desires. I want to do what I want to do. I don't want anybody telling me what I can do and what I can't do. I don't want anybody telling me how I can live, what I need to do, or what I, how I should live or how I shouldn't live. Uh, I want to decide that. And so that's where the scoffers begin. Now, what are they scoffing at particularly? Here it mentions a couple things. Number one, 
the return of Jesus Christ. They're scoffing at the return of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now why would they scoff at the return of Jesus Christ? I, I, I would submit to you they scoff at it because it's miraculous. It's miraculous. Everything about it is miraculous. The Bible says He's going to come again uh, from heaven. That's pretty miraculous. But not only that, He's not going to touch on the earth when He comes back for us. He's going to be in the clouds. That's pretty miraculous. And the Bible says we're going to hear the voice of God or the trump of God's going to sound and we're going to hear the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. That's pretty miraculous. And then he said the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Well, that's pretty miraculous. Then we which are lying remain, we're going to be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's pretty miraculous. And get, get this, all of that's going to take place, the Bible says, in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. Not, not in the blink of an eye, that, that's, that's too slow. If you blink, you'll have missed it for quite some time. A twinkle of an eye is, somebody tried to measure that, just the twinkle you see in someone's eye, and they said it's, it's over like one one-thousandth of a second. That's pretty fast. Miraculous. They scoff at it because it's miraculous. Hey, it, Paul said to the folks uh, when they were, he, he got them divided on the Pharisees and the Sadducees, remember? He said, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Why should we be thought a thing incredible with you that God can do miracles? Uh, that's not incredible. Uh, don't, don't be surprised when God does the miraculous. Uh, God, does, uh, God can do anything. God can do anything. And so it doesn't surprise me one bit. I, I, I'm expecting those things to happen. And I, so I think they scoff it because it's miraculous, but they also scoff because what I call continuousness. I'm not sure if that's a word, but it is now. Uh, continuousness. In other words, what do they say? All things continue as they were since the beginning of creation. People are born, people die, seasons come, seasons go, the cycle of life continues, it's uninterrupted, uh, everything just keeps on going the way it always has and it always will go that way. Nothing changes. But they won't realize that by mocking the Scripture, by, by scoffing at the promise of His return, they're actually fulfilling the Scripture that they say they don't believe in. They're fulfilling the Bible prophecy. And they illustrate the truth of God. Now, let me, let, let's make sure of something. The promise that Jesus Christ is coming again to this earth is absolutely sure. It's absolutely certain. Let's look at some Scriptures, okay? Put, put a little something there in 2 Peter 3. Uh, we'll come back there. But let's go over to John 14. Would you go there, please? John 14, the Lord Jesus is preparing His disciples for when He'll ascend back to heaven. He'll be crucified, and uh, He'll be buried. He'll ra raise again or rise again the third day. And then 40 days later, He'll ascend back to heaven. And He'll be at the right hand of the Father. He's preparing His disciples for this, okay? And He says, and you're familiar with this, John 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And then he says that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, notice the next four words. I will come again. Not I might come again. I'm considering coming again. It's a possibility I'll come again. He said, no, I will come again. And when I come again, I'm going to receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. It's an absolute certainty, an absolute promise of Jesus Christ that He will come again. Just as certain as He came the first time, He will come the second time. He promised that He would. Now, go over to Acts chapter 1. Right after the Gospel of John is the book of Acts. So just keep going to your right. And you'll come to the book of Acts. Acts 1 is where... Forty days after his resurrection, he is now ascending back to heaven. And it's recorded for us here in Acts chapter 1. Notice with me verse number 9. 
Acts 1 and verse 9. And when they had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. There's a promise now from the holy angels who, who were there when Christ went up to ascend to the right hand of the Father and he tells the followers, this same Jesus will come again. He is coming again. Now, how that's going to take place and what we mentioned earlier about the miraculous, that's recorded for us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Would you go there, please? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then you'll get to 1 Thessalonians. And then look at chapter 4. The Thessalonians were concerned about people in their church, uh, other church members that had died, and whether they were going to see them again, or what, what happened to them, where are they? And so the Lord has Paul write the letter here, and he answers this question. Look at verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. We won't go before. That's what prevent means. We won't go before them that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And verse 18 is a great verse, isn't it? Wherefore what? Comfort one another with these words. Hey, it's okay to be comforted. Comfort in the Bible oftentimes is not just a soothing or a, oh, it'll be okay. It's, it's also encouragement. Hey, encourage each other with these words. The Lord is coming again, and the Lord is returning, and we, if we're alive and remain, and, and notice what Paul wrote. He said, we which are alive and remain. I think Paul expected him to come when he was still alive. And uh, he said, we're going up to meet him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. It is a fact. Now, when is he coming? We'll come to that in a little bit. Nobody knows exactly when he's coming, but I know for sure he's coming. Uh, don't, don't, don't get... Uh, uh, don't think the delay means that he's not, it's not going to happen. All right? He, he has promised it, and it will come. And so the promise is sure. Okay? Now, that's the first thing they scoff at, the return of Christ. The second thing that they scoff at in 2 Peter chapter 3 is the creation of the world. The creation of the world. In spite of of there being zero proof of evolution. They refuse the biblical account of creation. They will not accept in the beginning God. There was only one person present when everything began. And that was God. And I think I'll take his word for it. Uh, he was there, and it happened the way he said it happened. He said, notice in, in 2 Peter 3, that, the, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, or the heavens yet were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. And he, he talks about the, the, the word of God, the heavens were old. God spake things into existence. That, say, that's pretty miraculous. Well, we're back to God again, aren't we? God can do the miraculous. God can do anything. And it's the word of his power. Remember, when you read Genesis 1, write it down. You go through Genesis 1 tonight and, and find out how many times you read this phrase, and God said, and then it'll say, and it was so. And God said, and it was so. 
And God said, and it was so. Just underline that every time you see that. It is amazing, the power of the Word of God. God spake the words into ex- the worlds into existence and into creation into existence. And of course, they, they, and by the way, not everything has continued the way it is since the beginning of the world. What he mentions here is not only the beginning of creation when there was the earth standing in the water and out of the water, but notice the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. When did that happen? That happened with Noah and the flood. And God, God rearranged the earth at that time, and the waters covered all the earth during that time. And, and he's saying, so not everything does just continue the way it always has been. Uh, God, God singled out Noah and his, families, and, and his family and kept them safe in the ark. And, and so they'd rather, listen, but they'd rather hold to theories and suppositions than hold to what God says. Now listen, I, you, can, you can hold to something different if you want. That's, you know, you're, you're free, it's America, you're free to do that. But if God's on one side of the argument and man's on the other side of the argument, I am going to take God's side. I think that's a safe place to be, don't you? Uh, I, I'm not talking about God being on my side. I want to be on God's side. And I'm going to be on his side of the argument. And so uh, they, they, so what do they do? The Bible says in um, verse number 12, I think it's from the other, yeah, in verse 12, chapter 2, verse 12. Notice it says, they speak evil of the things that they understand not. They don't understand creation, they understand what the Bible says about it, so what do they do? They'll speak evil about it. They'll say bad things about it because they do not understand it because verse 5 says they are willingly ignorant of it. Willingly. What's that mean? Their own will, their own volition. And ignorant, ignorant means they're destitute of knowledge, uninstructed, uninformed, untaught. They do not know the Bible. They do not know the biblical account of creation. You know why? Because they do not want to know it. Don't tell me what the Bible says. And and so they, they refuse it. So the two things they scoff at are the return of Christ and the creation of the world. And by the way, they it goes back to my own desires, living the way I want to live. If God created everything, understand this, look at me, if God created everything, then I'm accountable to a creator. That means I'm going to answer one day for how I live. And and he has a right to demand things of my life. You see, He's going to bring everything into judgment. I understand that. So I don't want that. I don't like that. I want to do what I want to do. So I have to discredit the fact that there's a creator. We all just are here. Everybody doing their own thing. And only the strong survive. See? And I can do whatever I want to do. Because I'm not accountable to anybody for that. See? And, and so, and it comes back to, I want to walk after my own desires. So they scoff at what's right and what's good. Now, the question that comes is, why hasn't Christ come back yet? They, they hear Paul, you heard Paul expect Jesus to come back in his day. You've been, if you've been saved, I've been in church all my life and probably cognizant of preaching and everything for over 50 years. And I've heard preachers preach for over 50 years that he's coming again. And I know they preached it before I came along. Well, what's happening? How come Christ hasn't come back yet? What's he waiting on? Well, let's look and see what the Bible says. Number one is time. Time. Verse number eight. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Remember, what did it say? They're willingly ignorant. Now he's saying, now listen, don't you be ignorant. Don't you be uninformed, untaught. Uh, uh, don't, don't you willingly not want to know this. Here's what you have to learn. One day is a, with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years has one day. In other words, God's view of time is different than ours. And you have to understand that. 
This epistle is being penned by Peter only 35 years after Christ ascended and went back to heaven. But they had already seen believers put out of their families, earthly families, because of their faith in Christ. They'd seen great persecution under the Romans upon the believers. And so the, the, the tendency again was to say, well, where, where is it? You, you say he's coming. I don't think he's coming. And remember, this is only 35 years after he left. And they were already thinking he is not coming back. And so they, he had to understand the, the concept of time. God says uh, there a thousand years is one day and one day is a thousand years. You used to think, you used to think, you know, you think 10 years is a pretty long time. But I've been here 10 years and it seems like you've got to be kidding me. It can't be 10 years. It seems to have went by like that. I was talking to somebody, was it Brenda? Talking about... Do, wasn't Y2K just like two years ago? Remember, we were all about Y2K. Ah, the computer's going to crash. Everything's going to work. Everything's going to go down. Remember that? And everybody kept stuff and watched that. Didn't know that was, that was going to be the... That was almost 16 years ago. Where did that go? You know, it, 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 it is... How many understand that... How many, how many understand the older you get, the faster time is going? Do you, you realize that? What's, what's 30 minutes? Like nothing. Let me ask you a question. When you were one of these kids up here singing, how long was 30 minutes? <laughs> Forever. When you used to sit in class and it was a 40-minute class or 45-minute class, you thought, man, will this thing ever end? Remember those days? Huh? Time just seemed to creep. You thought you'd never, you'd never get out of class. But the older you get, the faster it goes. God's been around a long time. He said, thousand, thousand years like one day to me. That's how fast time goes for God. Now, God's not bound by time. And He doesn't operate in the realm of, in the realm of time. That's why He told Moses, when he, Moses said, What's your name? Who am I going to tell him sent me? He said, You tell him, I am sent you. Because God's not I was, and God's not I'm going to be. God's always in the present. I am. God's not bound by our, our time frame. That's why I think, you know, God has to smile sometimes when we say, now, God, i got to have that by Friday at 5 o'clock. I think God smiles and says, is that right? Huh? That's true. Huh? So that's why, by the way, that's why God's never in a hurry. We are. We're always, what time is it? And where I got? Oh man, I got to be there, man. I'm late. We're, we're always in a hurry, always because of the constraints of time. God is not bound by time. Remember, uh, he he waited and and got the Lazarus for he's been dead four days. Martha couldn't understand it. You know why? Time. Lord, where were you? If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. God says, you're worried about time? You're worried about four days? Hmm? Lazarus, come forth! No big deal. I raised the dead. See, you see, uh, uh, nothing's too hard for God. And so, don't ever think that, well, it's over now, it's too late. You tell God it's too late. Hmm? Never too late for God. So you have to understand God's view of time, not ours, okay? Jesus Christ was here. It's 2016. It wasn't exactly, you know, before Christ and after Christ. It didn't turn right at the zero mark, you know. A few years overlap there. But let's say 2000, 2010 years ago. So it's been maybe a little over two days since Jesus was here. Two days. How many understand how fast two days can go? <laughs> Quickly. So we have to understand time. That's one reason. Let me look at the second reason. Verse number nine. The second reason is love. Love. 
Verse 9, the Lord's not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God waits, and He has not sent Jesus back yet to get His bride because He loves us. He's long, notice, He's long-suffering to usward. Not willing that any should perish. And I understand that can be general, generally thought he's long suffering to mankind, but I think he's long suffering to usward if you take it personally as believers. You think, well, he's being long suffering to the lost, and he is, but in this particular context, he's, he's talking about us. Remember, he's the one who told us in verse 8, but beloved, be not ignorant. He's talking to the beloved, he's talking to the other believers. He says, God's long suffering to usward. Because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, what's that mean? Hey, who's supposed to be giving the gospel to those so they can come to repentance? We are. So he's long-suffering toward us. He's he's loving toward us. So we'll have more opportunity to give the gospel to people so they can be saved. We're supposed to be doing the job. More time for us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. More opportunity to give the gospel to friends and loved ones and family members, co-workers. More opportunity for them to come to know Christ as their Savior before it's eternally too late. And let me make sure that that we understand something. The The last phrase of that verse, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Can I help you understand all means all? Okay, uh, hold your place there. Look at a couple of scriptures with me, will you? Uh, I want you to understand God wants all men to be saved. First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2. Would you look there, please? He tells Timothy here in First Timothy 2 verse 1 that he's exhorting them that prayers and their supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in sight of God our Savior. Now look at verse 4. Who will have all men to be what? Saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants all men to be saved. John 12 and verse number 32. Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. All men unto me. Acts 17, verse 30, The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Don't ever let someone tell you, well, no, he just is talking there. He's not willing that any of the elect should perish. Jesus didn't just die for the elect. Jesus died for all. There's no limited atonement taught in the Bible. It is it, Christ died for the world. All men. If all, listen, by one man, and one of the greatest proof texts I think is Romans, when it says by one man, Adam, all became sinners. And death passed on all men. Well, by one man, Jesus Christ, all can be saved. And if one man causes everybody to be a sinner, one man can cause all to be saved. What keeps men from being saved? Jesus looked at him and said, You will not come to me that you might have life. You know what keeps them? The will of man. You have to choose. God will not violate the will of man. He's given us the free will. And we have to choose to receive him as our Savior. And so, why hasn't he come? Number one, because of time. We have to understand time. Number two, because of love. He's given us opportunity. He loves us enough. Listen, remember... The dead in Christ are going to rise first and we're going to rise to meet them in the air and then so shall we ever be with the Lord. There is a reunion of our loved ones. I tell you, there's going to be, the Bible says there will come a time in heaven when when God will wipe away our tears. But up until then, we have some tears. What would we possibly have tears about in heaven? I think we'll have tears over loved ones who are not there. And God will take those away. And we won't have any remembrance of those former things. But you understand, there's going to be some sadness there. Let's take the opportunity. God has tarried it. He's, he's holding back sending Jesus so we could witness to folks. 
we could get our loved ones saved and, and see them come to Christ. And then number three is his promise. His promise. Here's the promise. It's in verse number 10. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to His promise look for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, the day of the Lord is not a 24-hour day. Okay? It's a term in the Bible associated with God's judgment. It's sort of like 2 Corinthians 6 when it says, Now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. It's a time period. It's, it's a period of time. Now is the time to get saved. This day of the Lord is a time period where God will bring judgment upon the earth and judgment upon the world. It's the, it's, it, it is the day of the Lord, the time of judgment. We have the rapture of the church. We have the tribulation period, which takes place on earth. Then we'll have the judgment of the earth. Christ comes the second time, and this time he comes to touch down on the earth, on the Mount of Olives, and he will put down the forces of the Antichrist and establish his millennial kingdom for a thousand years. And he'll rule and reign with, we'll rule and reign with him on this earth for a thousand years. But the Bible says he's going to destroy this earth and, and he's going to make a new heavens and a new earth. You know, this, this whole idea of let's save the earth and let's, be, let's try to take care of the earth. Hey, i got news for you. She's burning up. God's going to burn it up one day. Don't worry about it. You're not going to mess up God's plan. God's not going to look down and say, uh-oh, look what they're doing to my earth. Uh, I, I might figure something else you know, God never says, uh-oh. God never worries about man messing up his plan. God doesn't do that. But I, I want you to notice something. Uh, it says here it'll come as a thief in the night. Now, it, the Bible talks about that. Uh, in, in other words, unaware. If someone is going to break into your home, they generally don't call you and say, hey, if, you know, I, I really appreciate if you get to sleep early tonight, we're coming in to rob your house, okay? They don't do stuff like that. Okay? They, the, the, the idea is the element of surprise of you not knowing uh, that they're going to be there. And, and the Bible says, in, in fact, look over in Matthew 24. Would you look there, please? Matthew chapter 24. Are you okay? We're, we're just about done. Matthew 24. Notice with me verse number 36. <clears throat> Jesus speaking, and he says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noe, or Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not, until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. So Jesus is saying, here's, here's what was happening in the days of Noah. They just kept, they, they kept on living as if nothing was going to happen. What's eating, drinking, marrying, giving marriage? In other words, hey, we're just going to live. With no thought that this Noah guy saying judgment's coming or flood's coming or whatever he's talking about. He's some nut job. Don't listen to him. Hmm? And, and had nothing to do with it. And they knew not until the flood came. And they perished. See, it came upon them as a thief in the night. And that's how, by the way, that's how it'll come upon the world. Why? Because they scoff at His coming. 
They scoff at the creation. They scoff at the thought of God. They certainly scoff at the thought of Jesus and that Jesus is coming back. I can't imagine what, what the explanations are going to be when, when millions of Christians disappear from this earth and the chaos that's going to ensue afterwards. But now I want you to look at one other place. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Would you look there, please? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That's how it will hit the world. In other words, they just keep on living day in, day out, everything as usual, nothing's going to ever change. will always be the same. Kind of, hey, kind of how people talk about America. The... the mess that America is in. And you know what people say? Oh, well, we've always bounced back. We'll, we'll come back. It'll all come back around. No, we've never been $19 trillion in debt. We've never had 48 million people on food stamps and government assistance. We've never been in this situation before. And it is, if there's a road back, it is not an easy road back. And there very well may not be a road back for America. I know, boy, that's, that's exciting, isn't it? Boy, isn't that encouraging? <laughs> but it's reality. And here's, here's the situation here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now notice what Paul writes here. Notice verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, there it is, so cometh as a what? Thief in the night. Okay? Said, now I'm not, listen, nobody knows the day or the hour, and that's just logic, isn't it? Right now, it's already uh, Thursday in Japan. I think it's already Thursday in Australia and other parts of here. They're, they're, they're 12 hours and more ahead of us. So if I say he's coming on Wednesday, February 24th, well, what happens when it's already February 25th over there? You can't know the day or the hour, it's impossible. But you can know the times and the seasons. You know what's, what's coming about. Now notice what he says. For when they shall say peace and safety. Now that's interesting. And, and, and I, could, I could talk about this and I don't have time to. But listen, for years, and I know, listen, some of you, some of you were saved back then. For many years in the 70s and early 80s, the big, the big cry was peace. The, everybody was fearful of war. And so everybody was thinking about peace. Now, there's peace, but there's also the big word is the second word, safety. How many, how many freedoms have we given up in America in the name of safety? See, well, everybody's concerned about safety. That's the, big, the, that's the big cry. So when they say peace and safety, what happens? Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, has travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now watch. But ye brethren, hey, that's us, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Hey, it may overtake the world as a thief. It's not supposed to overtake us as a thief. We're, we're to be looking. We're to be watching. We're ready. We're prepared. You know, one preacher kept a sign on his desk that just said, maybe today. Just remind him that, hey, maybe today the Lord will come back. You know, cell phones have ruined some of that. You remember when you were little and you didn't have those cell phones and uh, someone, grandma, grandpa, or relatives would leave on a trip and they're coming to visit you? And you just knew they left and they'd be coming and what would you do? Especially kids, we'd always stand at the window, looking out the window. See them coming yet? See them coming yet? And pretty soon somebody get a little glimpse of the car. Hey, there they come. They're here. They're here. And everybody gets excited. Because you know what? You were anticipating them coming. Hmm? And, and that's the anticipation that I think we're supposed to have every day for the Lord Jesus to come. But I wonder how many times, and, and I'm guilty of it, I'm sure, have I just went through a day and did whatever, what I do every day. And never gave one thought to the fact Jesus could come today. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't catch us as a thief. It shouldn't catch us by surprise. We should be anticipating that. 
Man, when you see the sunrise, you see the sunsets, you all think, man, Jesus could come in those clouds. And it ought to be a conscious thought with us that it's not going to overtake us like a thief. And then God says it'll destroy the world. Listen, he promised he'd never do it again by a flood. He won't use water. This time he'll use fire. And it'll melt with a fervent heat. It's going to burn up. You know, the things that, things that everybody holds so dear and we think are so important are going to go up in smoke. You know what? The house will be gone. You know what? The bank will be gone. Hmm? The car, it's going up in smoke. It's going to be gone. It won't matter. Now, with that in mind, understanding that it's all going to be judged by God and God's going to take it all away and, and He's going to create a new heaven and earth. Listen, how exactly are we supposed to conduct ourselves then? How exactly are we supposed to live in light of what we know? We're going to talk about that next Wednesday night. Okay? So you've got to come back and find out what that's all about. All right? We'll finish that up next Wednesday evening. Let's stand together and we'll have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer this evening and Lord, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the promises of your word. Thank you, Lord, for your long suffering, for your love for us, that you're holding back your coming, that we might continue to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And Father, I pray that you'll help each of us to be the witnesses we ought to be for thee. I pray, Lord, that we'd understand that we do not know when you will come, but it might be today. It could still be tonight. And Lord, if we, if we knew that you'd come tonight, and we have some people in mind that we would definitely talk to and try to give the gospel to, then I pray, Lord, we would talk to them and give the gospel to them. For that is why you're tearing your coming. And so, Father, help us to have the same desire that you have, that you want all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And then, Lord, I pray that you remind us that your promise is sure and give us that expectancy every day. Give us that anticipation every day that maybe today we'll hear the trump of God. And in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be caught up to meet you in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Help us to encourage one another with those words. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord, and make us mindful of your presence as we go from this place. May others see Christ in our lives. And I'll thank you for it. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, what are we singing tonight? Let's, uh, we'll sing Higher Ground. Let's do that. You got that? Okay. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. It's 246 in the book if you need it. We'll just do the first verse and the chorus, all right? I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet higher ground Lord lift me up and let me stand my faith on heaven's table land a higher plane than I have found Lord plant my feet on higher ground God bless you you are dismissed